So I want to tell you about a study that convinced us of, further convinced us of the value of using clickers in class. This uh, study was the work of Michelle Smith, who was a very talented postdoc at the University of Colorado at that time as a, a teaching fellow, and a professor of genetics, Tin Tin Su, who was teaching the introductory genetics course. And Michelle was working with Tin Tin to try to help her transform her course to more active learning mode. And she urged Tin Tin to include clicker questions and showed her the data that often when you ask a question that's difficult and students, many students get it wrong and then you let them discuss with each other and then you ask again and most of them get it right, that the clickers are really a valuable learning tool. And Tintin, being a good skeptical scientist, said, well, how do you know that the students are actually learning anything in this process? Isn't it just as possible that the students are simply listening to whoever they think is the most knowledgeable person in their group and changing their answer accordingly? First, I'll ask you what you think about why students do better after discussing a question that many of them got wrong uh, than they did the first time around. And so Michelle and Tintin dreamed up an experiment to try to test that. The basis for their study was to develop pairs of questions that were isomorphic, uh, which means that it's the same, testing the same concept, but in a different context. So for example, you could have a, genetic, uh, a genetics question first with uh, fruit flies and then with mice. And it's getting at the same principle but it's a different experimental system and the names of the genes are different and so on. So it doesn't really look superficially like the same question, but it's testing the same concept. And the experimental design was to ask students the first question of a pair and then let them vote and not show them the result, then let them discuss it, and then ask the question again and let them vote again and don't show them the result. And then a little bit later, ask the isomorphic question and let them record their result and then give them the correct answer, explain the correct answer. Before I show you the results, take a moment to think about the experimental design. Here's the experimental protocol again, outlined in the next few slides. The results were based on student averages on a total of 16 such question pairs over the course of the semester. And I'll show you the actual numbers in a minute. So after posing the second question and recording the results, here are the patterns of results one could get. So now here's the question for you to think about. Which of the data sets shown here would allow you to answer the question at the top of the slide? And here's the answer and the rationale in the next few slides.
So the correct choice is A, or more precisely, comparing A and D with B and E. And here are the actual results Michelle and Tintin obtained. Here's a picture of the data and you can see that about 48% of students missed the question on the first go-round. When the question was re-asked after discussion, you can see that 41% of the students got it right now and 59% uh, still got it wrong. And then if you look at the isomorphic question, the people who changed their mind as a result of discussion got 77% correct on the isomorphic question and uh, the people who stayed with their incorrect answer only got 44% correct. So what they found was evidence that seemed to clearly indicate that students were in fact increasing their understanding through the discussion process. Because if you take the people who got it wrong the first time and then change their vote and got it right, after the discussion. They do much better on the subsequent isomorphic question than the students who did not change their mind on the first uh, after the discussion. The people who stayed with their incorrect answer only got 44% correct, which incidentally is much better than guessing, so maybe they learned something too during the discussion process. The other interesting thing that we learned from this uh, from this exercise is that if you look at the difficult questions where only about 20% of the students got it right the first time, then statistically it was clear that uh, more than half of the discussion groups did not contain anybody in them who knew the correct answer. And yet on the iteration after discussion and then on the subsequent uh, follow-up question, many of these groups arrived at the right answer. So this is a validation of the constructivist idea that the discussion process itself is really helping students get to the right answer rather than uh, the transmissionist view that what's happening is that the good students are telling the weaker students what the answer is. So an interesting aspect of this for us was that the students really understood what was going on in these discussions. We asked them a question in a survey at the end of the course is it important to have somebody who knows the answer in your group in order to have a productive discussion? One student said, often when talking through the questions, the group can figure out the questions without originally knowing the answer, and the answer almost always sticks better that way because we talked through it instead of just hearing the answer. And another said, discussion is productive when people do not know the answers because you explore all the options and eliminate the ones you know can't be correct. So we felt that this was a real uh, validation of the, first of all, the clicker approach in general, but also particularly the value of having the students argue about it and discuss in a group among themselves as a, process, as a part of the learning process.